Hello everybody, welcome to the Dr. Hayes Snow Day video audio lecture. Um, there's two parts to this because I actually had to make part of it last night for my other class. Um, this is being filmed in front of a live studio audience. I'm sitting at my kitchen table. Um, my sound engineer boyfriend is sitting on the couch listening to this and my dog is incredibly enthralled by this chapter on blood. I'm going to pick up, I think, where we left off in class, talking about the components of plasma. I'm going to continue on. This will be divided into two separate videos, so make sure that you watch both of them, and there will be some top hat questions assigned for you to do as homework. I'll put a link up if you're not familiar with how to use top hat. It's a little tutorial. It's pretty self-explanatory. And those questions need to be completed by the time we meet in class on Monday. I am starting around slide 18. It has table 17.1 on it that's looking at the composition of plasma. If you remember, plasma is the non-living matrix portion of blood. Remember, blood's a connective tissue. And plasma is mostly water, but dissolved in that water are over 100 different solutes, which include plasma proteins as well as electrolytes and some other substances. So all plasma proteins are going to be made by the liver and the three big ones are listed here albumin, globulins, and fibrinogen. There's a great table in your book. That page number is a little bit off because that's from the old edition of the book. I think it's somewhere around 637 is that table. On the next slide you can see here we're going to talk about albumin and if you've eaten eggs Lately, you've eaten albumin. That's the, the egg white protein as well. In humans, what albumin is going to do is act as a carrier or a shuttle molecule to help move substances through the blood. There are some substances that are hydrophilic. They're water-loving. There are other substances that are hydrophobic. Those are water-hating. And because blood is, is so much water, if something is water-hating, it can't move through the blood without a little bit of assistance. And that's where albumin can come into play. In this image here, you see this very large yellow albumin protein molecule, and then kind of embedded or studded on it is this red round structure that is a drug, in this case paclitaxel, if I remember correctly, it's a chemotherapy drug. And you can see that the albumin is shuttling that paclitaxel, which is hydrophobic, through the blood to its site of action. Now, the two other functions of albumin we're not going to get into in great detail because we'll talk about them a lot when we get to the kidney chapter, is they can act as a buffer, which means they can prevent big changes in the pH of blood and also help maintain the osmotic pressure of the blood. Globulins, these are also dissolved in the plasma. They're also proteins. They're also made in the liver. There's three different kinds. There's alpha globulins, beta globulins, and gamma globulins. Alpha and beta globulins act almost identical to what albumin does. They're acting as transports for things like fats or metals or vitamins. The gamma globulins are very different though. They're kind of this odd duck, the, the weird cousin of the globulin family. They actually are going to have an immune system function. They're going to act like antibodies, which are substances that mark something for destruction. So an antibody cannot actually destroy something like a bacteria or a virus, but it can mark it so another cell knows to destroy it. Fibrinogen is our third blood clotting protein. It is the least abundant. I wouldn't necessarily say it's the most important, but it's pretty dang important. This is going to help form blood clots. Um, without fibrinogen, you could potentially bleed to death from something very, very simple, um, like a bruise or a small cut that most of us would be able to deal with relatively easily. Now, also dissolved in our plasma are electrolytes. So if you remember back to chemistry or intrabiology or AMP1, an electrolyte is a small substance that has some sort of electrical charge. So I've listed several of those here. Sodium would be written as Na+, potassium K+, calcium Ca2+, so on and so on. All of these electrolytes have an electrical charge on them. 
they do a very similar job to two of the jobs that albumin does that help maintain osmotic pressure and pH. Again, we'll spend a lot of time in the kidney chapter talking about that. And they are the most abundant substance that we find dissolved in our plasma. They're very, very small, but there's lots and lots and lots of them. So now what we're going to talk about are, is the living component of blood. We have the non-living matrix, the plasma. Now we're going to talk about what are called the formed elements. These only survive for a couple of days as opposed to some of our other cells, which can last years and years and years. And the other very odd thing about the cells found in our blood is they don't do cell division by mitosis. So for example, if you cut yourself and your skin heals, and you, you get some scar tissue where it's healed, that's because skin cells and connective tissue have done mitosis in order to heal that area. Those cells have divided. In the case of blood cells, they are all going to originate in our red bone marrow. Now, depending on how old you are, your red bone marrow can be located in different places. If you're a child, your red bone marrow is all throughout your long bones, so in the um, epiphyses as well as the diaphyses, the shaft as well as the head of the bones. Um, for people over about the age of 20 or so, your red bone marrow is going to be more likely to be found in the ends of your long bones, especially in the ball of the femur. We have a really rich concentration of red bone marrow there. We also have a really rich concentration of it in the sternum, it's really hard to get to there. So in the case of bone marrow donations, that tends to be from the that hip, ball of the hip. Um, now, it's not just when you get older that your bones are empty now. It's just in the shaft of our bones when we get older. That tends to be replaced by yellow bone marrow, which is made of fat, as opposed to this red bone marrow that can make new blood cells. So we have in that bone marrow what are called stem cells. These are undifferentiated cells. What that means is it's a cell that has the potential to become several different things. In particular, it's a stem cell called a hematopoietic stem cell. It's a bit of a mouthful. The vowels don't look like they go in the right place. But that hematopoietic stem cell in the red bone marrow can become an erythrocyte, a leukocyte, or a platelet. So we're going to start talking about erythrocytes first. Um, these are by far the most abundant cell that you have in your blood. We can measure the number of erythrocytes. It's a measurement referred to as hematocrit. Um, they're very dense. They tend to settle to the bottom when we put whole blood in a centrifuge. And what's strange about them is they actually don't have a nucleus or organelles. So an erythrocyte does not have DNA in it, does not have ribosomes or lysosomes or mitochondria or any of those things that we typically think of when we think of the contents of a cell. Now that doesn't mean it never has that. It just means when it is functioning as an erythrocyte carrying oxygen around, that is its one and sole function in life, is to carry oxygen, that at that point it does not have the nucleus or organelles. What an erythrocyte does have is a whole lot of something called hemoglobin that's going to be involved in the oxygen transport, as well as some antioxidants that's going to help protect this cell from the damage that oxygen could potentially cause, and then some structural proteins just to help keep it in the shape that it needs to be. You can see here that erythrocytes have a very unique shape. They're this little round disc that is almost like compressed in the middle. I picture it being like a junior mint. You've kind of squished between your fingers. They are very, very flexible cells because when we get down to the smallest capillaries you have in your body, those capillaries are so small, these cells have to pass through in single file and they need to be able to bend and twist through some tight spaces. So flexibility is really key with these erythrocytes. Now, their structure, again, relates a lot to their function. They have what's called a very high surface area to volume ratio. Um, just a quick primer on this. The larger an object gets, the smaller its surface area to volume ratio. So a very small object, like an erythrocyte, has a whole lot of surface area compared to its volume. And the reason this is so important 
is an erythrocyte's job is to transport oxygen. It's going to pick it up in the lungs. It's going to take it to the cells. And so it needs to be easy for that oxygen to move in and out of the erythrocyte. And so that, that structure and that surface area to volume ratio is very, very important. This would not work well if instead of having, you know, a billion red blood cells that we had that are really tiny, that we had a thousand red blood cells that were really big. It, just, it wouldn't work the same way. Now, these erythrocytes are almost completely hemoglobin, 97% hemoglobin, and that's going to matter because their only job is transporting oxygen. Now, what's really strange about this, though, is you would think that the cell toting around oxygen all the time would use that oxygen to make a little bit of ATP. But if you remember, they don't have a mitochondria, so they can't do cellular respiration. They can't take oxygen and glucose and make ATP the way the rest of your cells can. So an erythrocyte actually uses an anaerobic pathway, so a non-oxygen using pathway, to make ATP. The analogy I like to use here is just because somebody drives the armored car or the Brinks truck that's full of money, they can't use that money to pay their rent, right? They have to use their paycheck for that. So let's look at the hemoglobin that is contained inside the erythrocyte. Hemoglobin is what's going to be responsible for carrying the oxygen within that erythrocyte. It is going to have a protein portion. If you look at this image here on the slide, that brown folded up structure is our protein. That's known as the globin protein. It's made of amino acids. It's folded into a very specific structure. Um, also within that globin protein, you can see four red discs. Those are known as the heme group or heme pigment. And in the center of that heme group is a green dot and that is a molecule of iron. So those are really the three ingredients that it takes to make hemoglobin. We need the protein part, we need the heme group, and we need the iron. So each of these hemoglobin molecules is capable of carrying four molecules of oxygen. So remember, an atom of oxygen would be O, a molecule of oxygen would be O2. So we combine four of those oxygen molecules to this hemoglobin, and notice on there it says it reversibly binds the oxygen. It needs to be able to carry it, but hemoglobin also has to be able to let the oxygen go when we get to an area that it's needed. So the question is, how does it know when it's time to let go of that oxygen? The hemoglobin's gonna get loaded up with oxygen when that blood is passing through our lungs. How does it know when to let go? And how it knows when to let go is when it gets to a tissue where there's not a lot of oxygen, right? If you've got a lot of oxygen in your blood and that blood gets down to the muscles of your pinky toe and there's not a lot of oxygen there, that will trigger it to release the oxygen and it can move into the tissues. There's a great, it's very short, maybe two minutes. There's a nice little video on Georgia View that you can watch. Um, I'll make sure that's linked in the same post as this. Now, not every species uses hemoglobin as the the pigment or the oxygen carrying tool in its blood. Um, I know this is human anatomy, but I'm kind of a nerd. Some species have what's called hemocyanin. Instead of iron, they have copper in their blood and that causes them to have blue blood. Some organisms have hemerythrin, which causes them to have this kind of bright violet pink blood. Some species have biliverdin, which causes them to have green blood. So the color of your blood really comes down to what pigment do you have inside your erythrocytes. Now remember, in a human, blood is always, always, always red. Sometimes it's dark red, sometimes it's a more bright red, but it's always red because of that heme group. So I have an interesting question up here. How many molecules are, of hemoglobin are found in a single erythrocyte? So in one red blood cell, how many of those hemoglobins do we have? And then how many oxygen molecules could be carried by a single erythrocyte? I want you guys to find the answer to that, and we're going to see what you come up with the next time we meet with each other.
Now, I mentioned there's a video on Georgia View. You can take a look at that. We can use some different names for hemoglobin depending on whether it has an oxygen molecule or molecules attached to it or not. It doesn't always have oxygen attached to it. If it does, we would refer to it as oxyhemoglobin. If it does not have oxygen, we would refer to it as deoxyhemoglobin. Now, when hemoglobin drops off oxygen, right, it's gotten down there to the muscles of your pinky toe and the oxygen is being dropped off so those cells can use it to make ATP, the blood is picking up carbon dioxide, which is metabolic waste of that cellular respiration process. But it's not just an interchangeable process. We don't take oxygen off of hemoglobin and stick carbon dioxide back in the same spot. CO2 can bind to the protein part, that brown globin protein part, to form a substance called carb amino hemoglobin. If you have a hemoglobin molecule with carbon dioxide bound to it, that's what we would call it. What you will never find is a molecule of hemoglobin that has both oxygen and carbon dioxide attached to it at the same time. So the question is, how does our body make new erythrocytes? We clearly have a lot of them. And this term here, hematopoiesis, that's going to be a broad term. Hematopoiesis is the making of any blood cell, a red blood cell, a white blood cell, or a platelet. If we want to get more specific, the term erythropoiesis is going to talk about the process of making new red blood cells. Again, this happens in the red bone marrow, so depending on your age, that could either be throughout your bones if you're young or more condensed in the, the ends of your bones or your sternum if you're older. And it's capable of producing over 100 billion new cells a day. So our body is very, very busy forming erythrocytes, mostly because they don't last for very long. Now you can see this process down here in this figure. We're going to step through this, but one of the really important things to notice here is every red blood cell, erythrocyte, leukocyte, or platelet is going to start out as a hematopoietic stem cell. Remember, that's that undifferentiated cell in the bone marrow. It has the potential to become any one of those cells at this point. It will reach a stage when it can't change its mind, but right now the options are wide open for that. And one thing I want to note for you guys, when I'm using terms like erythropoiesis or hematopoiesis or um, carbaminohemoglobin, you're probably not going to see a question on a test that says define carbaminohemoglobin, but I'm probably going to use that term in a question and I expect you to know that term. So just keep that in mind as you study. So you'll notice on this figure, once we go from the stem cell, we move to this part of the pathway called a committed cell. Once the pathway gets to this point, there is no turning back. Once you are committed, you are locked in forever. And you'll notice in the erythrocyte pathway, this committed cell is called a proerythroblast. And it looks pretty much like a normal cell. It's pretty big. It has a big nucleus. There are organelles in there. This doesn't really look like what I described about an erythrocyte. But you'll notice as you move down this pathway, the cell shape changes, the, the contents of the cell changes, and eventually we're going to wind up with something that looks a lot more like this erythrocyte we've talked about. In this first phase, this basophilic erythroblast phase, this figure says that we're experiencing ribosome synthesis. So these cells are making a huge number of ribosomes. Ribosomes are these small organelles located in the cell, and if you remember, their function is to make proteins. And that kind of makes sense if you need to make a whole bunch of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is based around this globin protein structure, 
we need all of those ribosomes in order to make those proteins for the hemoglobin. And you'll see in that second stage there, that polychromatic erythroblast, that's where iron is starting to accumulate as well. Iron is a pretty precious commodity in the body. It's not something we can make. It has to come from our diet. And so the iron is going to accumulate so we can make the hemoglobin there. As we get down toward the end to this orthochromatic erythroblast, notice that the organelles are getting ejected and the nucleus is breaking down. We're done with those. Because these cells are not going to go on and divide and do mitotic cell division, we don't need those components anymore. So by getting rid of them, we can make even more room for hemoglobin within that cell. And this is when it starts to take on that very characteristic shape as well. This reticulocyte down here, this is a very young erythrocyte. It's not quite ready to go out into the blood and carry oxygen, but it's almost there. This is that very last maturing stage that these cells go through. It's only in this stage for about two days before it goes on to assume the final mature erythrocyte stage. One thing I want you to notice about the names of these cells. So we go from a proerythroblast to a basophilic erythroblast to a polychromatic erythroblast to an orthochromatic erythroblast. All of those cell names at the beginning of the process have blast at the end. And our mature cells have sight at the end. And if you remember way back from AMP1, the difference is when you see blast at the end of a cell, that's a younger cell. It tends to do more division or more work like making ribosomes or proteins, whereas sight at the end of a cell is an older, more mature cell that is doing its ultimate function. So blast and sight are suffixes that can really help you figure out what the function of a cell is if you're not quite sure what the function of that cell is. What controls the process is of course a hormone. A lot of you mentioned that you didn't get to the endocrine system chapter in your AMP class. I am going to post my chapter 16 notes from when I teach AMP1 just to give you um, a review or a primer, if you will. You can always look back in your textbook as well. A hormone is a substance that is released from an endocrine gland or cell. So glands could be things like your thyroid or ovaries or adrenal glands. Um, but we also have endocrine cells in other places capable of producing hormones. Hormones are going to move through the blood. They're going to act on a target. And usually what triggers the release of a hormone is something being out of homeostasis. A really good example of this is insulin. It's one most of us are probably very familiar with. Um, before I started recording, we uh, whipped up some peanut butter cookies here in the Hayes Barfield kitchen. They're delicious. And I ate one, and that caused my blood sugar to go up. And that put my blood sugar out of homeostasis. My body has a zone where it likes my blood sugar to be. And so to get that blood sugar back in homeostasis, my pancreas released insulin which helped move that sugar out of my blood and into my cells. So here in a little while, my blood sugar is going to go back down to normal. I'll be back in homeostasis. My pancreas can quit working for a while. That's a good practical example of the way a hormone works. It's good old-fashioned negative feedback. Once I'm back in homeostasis, the response stopped and I quit releasing insulin. So here we're going to use a very similar pathway except now we're going to use a hormone called erythropoietin. We abbreviate it EPO because it's hard to spell and say, and it is going to stimulate the formation of erythrocytes. Now, the question is, we said hormones are typically released when something occurs to get the body out of homeostasis. And in this case, what that homeostatic balance we're looking for is, is a normal amount of oxygen in the blood. The body has a specific amount of oxygen it likes to have in the blood, and if it has too much or too little, the body is out of homeostasis. Too little is definitely a bigger concern than too much, for sure. So 
If you have too little oxygen in your blood, you are considered hypoxic. Now, this is usually going to occur when your blood oxygen percent, if you've ever had a pulse oximeter put on your finger, when that percent gets to a below about 90 or 92 percent, you would be considered hypoxic. Now, how do you get hypoxic is the question. There's a couple of different ways you can become hypoxic, and they all have to do with something occurring to limit the amount of oxygen that is able to attach to your hemoglobin. So it could be something as simple as, well, not simple, but say you have an illness, you have pneumonia, or you have bronchitis as a short-term illness, or say you have something more significant, like you have cystic fibrosis, some kind of illness that makes it hard to breathe, COPD or emphysema or chronic examples, those could all lead you to being hypoxic because you're unable to bring in enough oxygen for your cells. Another example would be if you are at high altitude. The higher the altitude you're at, you've probably heard the phrase, the air is thinner. Um, it has to do with air pressure, and that means it can be more difficult to fully saturate your blood with oxygen, and you can experience something called altitude sickness. You could fall in a pool and drown, or somebody could strangle you, which I know sounds really scary, but those are things that could prevent the flow of oxygen. You could have a decreased amount of hemoglobin. Maybe your body has not been able to make the correct amount of hemoglobin, so even though you have plenty of red blood cells, if you don't have hemoglobin to carry the oxygen, your blood oxygen would be low. You could have a decreased number of erythrocytes for some reason. Whatever the reason that you are hypoxic, the end result is going to be hypoxia, which triggers the release of this hormone EPO. And if you look at this nice figure here, um, figure 17.6, I'm not sure if that figure number is the same in this updated version of the textbook, but it should be close. The kidney and a little bit from the liver are the organs that are going to be responsible for making this hormone EPO. So you have become hypoxic and your blood oxygen is low. That will trigger the cells of the kidney and a little bit from the liver to release this hormone EPO into your blood, which then targets your red bone marrow. So the hormone is going to tell the red bone marrow, kick into gear, we need to make some more erythrocytes. Those erythrocytes increase in number, and that should increase the amount of oxygen in your blood. Once blood oxygen gets back to normal, your body is going to stop producing that hormone EPO. It seems relatively simple. Where this can get very challenging is most of us make normal amounts of EPO because our kidneys and our livers work just fine. Um, but for patients who are in kidney failure, who are having to use dialysis, they often don't have enough EPO, and that can cause them to have low numbers of erythrocytes, they don't have enough oxygen in their blood, they're very weak, and so we can inject them with EPO for therapeutic purposes to help improve their quality of life. Um, when we inject something like that, we refer to it as exogenous you are making EPO, and we would refer to it as endogenous. So exogenous EPO is manufactured for therapeutic purposes, but like a lot of things that are made for good, they often get used for evil as well, and this is one of those. Some athletes will use EPO supposedly to help them enhance performance. This is actually a banned substance um, for use by the U.S. Olympic Committee and several other major sporting events. And the premise behind this is if I inject EPO and raise my EPO levels, I'll make even more erythrocytes, I can carry even more oxygen in my blood, and I can perform better because my muscles will get more oxygen. The premise is good. It makes sense. However, where this can be very, very dangerous is if you increase the number of red blood cells in your blood, you can risk blood clots. So definitely not the wisest idea. I mentioned before that the iron that's part of our hemoglobin has to come from our diet. About 65% of the iron in your body is located in the hemoglobin in your erythrocytes. The rest of it tends to accumulate in the liver, which is why in a lot of cultures, 
um, eating liver is done a lot because it's very, very nutrient dense. Organ meat in general is. I am not a fan. My dad was a very big fan of liver and onions. That was the only night I was allowed to make peanut butter and jelly instead of eating what mom cooked for dinner. The really tricky thing about iron, though, is it's toxic if it's floating around there in the blood by itself. So iron is never alone. It's always going to be stored in complex or transported in complex with a protein. It can be stored with these two proteins listed here. They're called ferritin or hemosiderin. So the iron that's in your liver, for example, would be attached to one of those two proteins. If we need to transport iron, if we're trying to get some iron from the liver and say get it to the red bone marrow because we're making more erythrocytes, we would use a protein called transferrin, which it makes me giggle because it sounds like transfer and ferric is the Latin root for iron, so it's pretty easy to remember there. I'm getting laughed at from the living room. Erythrocytes only last about 100 to 120 days. So we're talking about three months here is how long they're going to last. And the reason that's so short is they because they don't have a nucleus or organelles, they're not capable of doing any kind of cell repair if they get damaged. What's going to indicate that an erythrocyte is on its last legs, that it's time for it to die, is that it'll start to lose its flexibility, which we said was very important for moving through the narrow capillaries, and the hemoglobin starts to break down. And when hemoglobin breaks down, it's not able to as efficiently carry oxygen. So I'm going to stop right here. I just ended on slide 41. The second half of this is going to pick up on slide 42 and take you through the end of this chapter. So just remember, you've got some top pack questions to answer once you get done listening. See you guys next week.